going to get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm David Taylor with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and have been um, privileged to be part of this Dreamkeeper initiative for the last couple of years. Really good to see some familiar faces in the room. Um, today's panel will be a discussion on uh, the importance of black faces in the American education system. Um, you heard some of those in here earlier, but you were in the last panel, you heard Dr. Nunley and Dr. Lucky talk a little bit about how they use African pedagogy for what they're doing and some of the work that they're doing in their uh, work with students in post-secondary. So we will obviously, well not obviously, but we will be sort of revisiting some of that subject matter in this, in this panel discussion. So welcome all, thank you. Hoping the day is going well for you so far. Um, I'd like to introduce my panel, and I get to get sit over here and be quiet and be the bad guy and tell folks, time's up. A couple things. The workshop is supposed to be for about 45 minutes, but we'll probably run a little longer simply because um, we have that time. There's no afternoon session, no second session after this. Um, at the end of the presentation, we do ask you to stay if you want for questions and answers. If something's burning, you just got to raise your hand. Feel free to do it. We'd be, you know, be glad to answer it on the spot. Um, but outside of that, you hear noise next door. That's the entrepreneur folks making noise. <laughs> and you hear folks out there. That's the folks selling selling goods. So try to hope the noise won't be too much of a distraction for you. With that said, I'd like to introduce the panel and start with my colleague and moderator of this panel, Carmen Chowler. And thank you. She's been with us for a while, uh, about a year now, and part of our Dreamkeeper team. And has just been a wonderful, wonderful colleague. To her left is Randy Saraguchi, Executive Director of Urban Ed Academy. And I'll let Randy talk a little bit more about what, that, what, what his agency does. But basically, they're known for uh, several things. But one of the main programs that we are involved with in partnership is something called Man the Bay, which is a program designed to recruit black males all over the country to come to San Francisco and be part of the San Francisco early uh, elementary school system. And we've got some questions that we'll be asking a little bit later about your, your exposure to that in your early child, in your uh, early days in education and school. Next to Randy to his left is Diane Gray, Executive Director of 100% College Prep. Um, many of you may have heard of that agency. It's done, been around for a while, as is Randy's. Um, and I'll let Diane talk about her program when she gets a chance to speak. We have Kevin Williams, who's also with 100% College Prep. He works with the student alumni and does a lot of the work that Diane doesn't do. So, <laughs> and so from the fact of uh, wanting to welcome these three individuals to our panel, thank you all. And it was a pleasure to be taking that time. Yes, thank you. All for being here and I want to thank my panelists for also making the time to be here and talk about um, education and the importance of black faces in education. Um, it's an honor to be the program specialist for your two programs and so I just want to say thank you. Um, but yeah I just wanted to engage in a conversation um, really about just the holistic and uh, current and then future what we're really looking for towards the future. Um, so I noticed that many school districts in the past few years have really been putting into their strategic plans um, more tailored and specific um, plans for black students. Um, specifically, San Francisco Unified has a Vision 2025 plan, and they've identified English language learners, uh, African American students, and students with disabilities. For black students, they really want to focus on three key points that I wanted to engage in the panel with. Um, they want to accelerate academic achievement and success, strengthen partnerships with community-based organizations, such as these two, um, and addressing culturally relevant pedagogy and providing professional development around racial bias. So both of your organizations are leading the charge in all three of those areas. And I just wanted to ask, how do each of you feel we are getting closer to that vision um, with respect to each of your programs? And I can always get you those three again. <laughs> so I'll start first. <laughs> Break the ice. Um, again, I'm Diane Gray, co-founder and uh, director of 100% College Prep. We are a college prep program 
um, started in the Bayview Hunters Point community. Um, my cousin and I in 1999, we were already uh, volunteering in our the community that we grew up in. We're both natives of San Francisco and natives of the Baby Hunters Point community. And um, in that volunteering uh, conversations with the young people we were volunteering with, they were preteens to about 14 years old and didn't like what we heard. Um, didn't like what we heard on two fronts. One, um, that the young people um, didn't like school, you know, didn't really know anyone who attended college um, and so on and so forth. Weren't really thinking about their future. Still kind of young, but still not having a clue. And as we dug deeper and deeper in that, we found out that the schools weren't preparing them either. You know, as we began to work more and more with these young people and a little bit older as they were in high school, 14 was just starting high school, um, we found out that they weren't getting any guidance, any counseling, even those students who were doing well that had a B average or better. Um, for example, um, weren't getting any guidance around um, taking uh, the right courses um, to be on track to get into a UC. Weren't taking the right math courses. Um, language other than English. They take French this semester. They take Spanish the next semester, not knowing that there's a, you know, there's a pattern and a consistency just to the courses that you're supposed to take. And so when we saw that, we just rolled up our sleeves and got to work with other parents in the community. And we did that for six years, not even really being a nonprofit, not having a nonprofit status, and just with parents and community, and really educating ourselves. I had um, completed college. My cousin had done a couple of years in college, and we were just like, what would have helped us? What would have met, you know, had us be more successful um, as we uh, on that journey through college and, and career? And so that's really how we started um, right there in the community of doing that. Again, with very little money, um, but we would partner with other organizations. And um, my background is I work with the city um, for 20 years. I worked in different departments throughout the city, um, San Francisco PUC as one of them. And then my last job was with San Francisco Unified School District. And it was because of the work in the community that I got the, that I sought out a job um, to work in the district. And with that, um, developed a lot of par uh, uh, relationships. And when I left and took an early retirement um, in 2010, could really, um, continue working um, in partnership with San Francisco Unified. So I was an employee when they developed this uh, Vision 2025. And we'll talk uh, more about that. More about, are we really there? How far, you know, it's like two years now. And I think it was crafted, I want to say it was crafted around um, 2015, I think 10 years out. So we're, I was still kind of partnerships with the school district. So we'll talk definitely and want to hear um, from you as well, um, your ideas around this as well, if you know a little bit about that vision, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. But yes, we've been partnering with the district. We partner with other um, community-based organizations that also work with the district. But there's a lot of work to still to be done um, in our district around this, this vision. Okay. And I think maybe it, that could be a good bridge kind of between us. Uh, so um, Urban Ed Academy has been around since 2010. Uh, we started as a Saturday school um, in the Bayview and similar to, to what 100% uh, uh, it, was looking to do, it was more of a response to what we weren't seeing. Um, and you look at the landscape of, of teachers in public schools, less than 2% of all teachers nationally are black men. Here in San Francisco, that's actually less than that. Um, we're probably floating closer to around 1.5% or so of the nearly 4,000 teachers in the district. Um, and so the Saturday school solution was a solution to improving out of school time for kids. Um, what we found, even at, at as early as third, fourth, and fifth grade, 
um, black boys in particular were disproportionately taken out of classrooms, either because of disciplinary status, there might be some truancy issues, probably got the T issues, but the end result of whatever we were looking at was boys weren't in seats Monday through Friday when we're looking at school happening. And so you compound the effects over 180 days and there's no surprise that you know, they're one of the lowest performing <coughs> student groups, not just here, but across the country. Um, and so from 2010 to 2016, when I got in here, the, we served somewhere between 800 and 900 black boys in the city. Um, the primary focus was matching them with men that look like them. So bringing in volunteers, mentors as black men to help build uh, excitement around enrichment and academics, um, namely around STEM. Um, and so we had um, a lot of activities focused on building electric bikes, building radios, um, making sure kids knew that they could learn while also getting their hands dirty, really being able to do something. Um, but <clears throat> as great as that was, um, I saw that we could do something a little bigger. Um, and as for all of the good work that we could squeeze out of Saturdays, there were only 16 Saturdays out of the year that we were doing something. Um, Monday through Friday was really where the work needed to happen. And so and everybody, well, what are you doing differently? It's like nothing different than what like these credential teachers are doing. You know, they get these kids, they have a captive audience, they're able to take advantage of the resources in the school. And yes, schools are under-resourced, but again, 180 days versus 16, you got to kind of go to where you could have maximum impact. Um, but, and so the, the real secret sauce was who are in front of these kids. And so when you have 1.5% black men, like that's yeah, startling, but by and large, this is a, profession for a whole lot of reasons but this is a profession dominated by white women and this this is not to castigate white women there's plenty that i've met that have big hearts love what they're doing love their students and the families but there's just something different about the connection that you can build with a young person when they can see themselves in a model of success and so amanda bay was born out of this uh this vision to ensure that every child has a black male teacher in their lifetime. Um, and that's like a grandiose vision for a place where teachers can't afford to live. Um, so the practical mission, we wanted to start early, kind of building on what we did with Saturdays. And that is, if we can get one black male teacher in every elementary school in the city, we can keep going from there. And so that's, that's our current mission right now. Um, but to get men who are Right now, you look at the numbers, not interested in teaching, not even thinking about it. Um, you, got, you have to be able to change hearts and minds of these young people first. So the recruitment efforts is really what we had to do um, and kind of in inspiration from 100% um, decided to build out a network of HBCU partners where we, we wouldn't have to explain ourselves about what we were going for. You go to an HBCU, you know you're going for black people on some, <laughs> some level. Um, and, but you know that the black men are there. Um, but to make it real, like let's say we get you excited and we can get you there, to make it real to live in a place like San Francisco, be in a place like San Francisco, you have to have a baseline level of costs eliminated from it. And so we sort of look, zoomed out, looked at what it takes to be a, a public servant here in the city. It's not easy. We don't have a bag of money to throw at every person to make sure that their salary is there. Um, but uh, if you look at this balance sheet of life, if we can't throw money in the income column, the, the least we can do is start eliminating costs on the other side. So we built this fellowship called Man the Bay based on that model. For four years, we'll eliminate or severely reduce the cost of living, reduce the cost of entering into the profession. So all of the tests, the tuition, the fees, everything involved with actually getting there, let's take that off the table for you make it easy for you to say yes to this service. Because one thing to get a guy excited about coming on a Saturday is a one-off. It's a whole other thing to ask a guy to commit to a profession like teaching. Um, and that was in 2018, after I got, I bumped my head around a little bit. This was my first job as an ED, um, building a budget, learning how to build a board. Um, and so made a lot of mistakes and learned some lessons. But since 2018, um, we've recruited five cohorts to the city because of the, the investment we make, we invest over $100,000 in each man over the four year commitment. Um, we've taken our time. And so each year we brought in somewhere between four and five, six men um, by housing them, 
working with black homeowners specifically, if we're going to be spending that much money, we wanted to make sure from a racial equity perspective, the money is staying within the black community um, and help them every step along the way um, to, to doing this work that we're asking them to do. Um, I, I just want to add to put that in perspective, that's like 77 brother teachers in the district right there, like 77 elementary schools. Is yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's attainable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, you know, we got our, our hands full when you look at us, a little nonprofit with a little budget, and then a $1.3 billion machine called SFUSD mm -hmm. that we're outpacing when it comes to recruiting these men. Um, and so that's not to brag because we got a lot of work to do, but um, I, I, I'll get sling back to the question around what I think about 2025 plan. Okay, uh, perfect. Thank you for sharing that with right brother. Uh, in addition to executing um, Diane's vision, um, I'm Brother Kevin, I'm an innovative educator. Um, I've worked in this field for the last 15 years. Um, I started off as a paraprofessional and then I transitioned to a um, special education teacher. And um, for those who are familiar with the schools in the city, I worked at Alton. Um, to answer the question directly, um, I think there's some things that we've done. So prior to me working as a program manager we did through college um, for our post-secondary students, um, I've worked with uh, our K through K through eighth population down at AG, also known as Double Rock. I'll personally never call it AG, but we're gonna leave it as Double Rock. And over there, I was the uh, educational liaison. And um, we had the opportunity, just based off the question, like what are some things that we've been doing to mitigate some of the issues we've seen? Um, we've built re relational trust within the relationship, within the community. So first thing we would do is we'd go to Bret Hart, we'd identify the problem. Then we're going to the community, listen to them. I feel like so often we come in and we try to dictate what the community wants, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did was we went in, we listened to them, uh, we, we have a problem, we address the problem uh, collectively as a community, right? So the biggest thing was that we noticed that our third grade, uh, most, if not all, our third grade students were not on reading levels. And we know that study studies have shown that third grade students are not within reading levels. They tend to, you know, lead more into the prison pipeline. So what we did was we came up with a concept. It was called Get Through, um, Get Caught Reading, right? So we knew that everybody loved to read in the neighborhood. It was just a matter of, you know, um, making them hungry, making them learners, right? Uh, also understanding that it's not just what you read in school, it's what you read outside of school, right? So we started bringing maps. Uh, we started building um, parent, parent workshops in which we really focused on the importance of reading, right? And showed them these numbers and talked about the things that we could do to move forward. Uh, a lot of things that we did was tailored around functional everyday stuff. Um, we ended up making the first um, Get Caught Reading Library in Double Rock, which they now have at, at Bret Hart. So just built this whole culture around reading and the importance of it. So I think to answer the question, um, for me, it's identifying the problem, going into the community, hashing it out, and coming up and executing the plan that works within the community. And I think also with that, um, when Kevin says bring that into the community, um, he actually brought principals, teachers over to the community, to Bret Hart. That was super, super important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about parent involvement and all of that, but what involvement really looks like, right? And, and who's, being, who's doing the asking and, who, and where is that happening, right? And so to bring those educators and those professionals and administrators into the community to see where the families are, how they live, and to speak to them in their own environment where it's comfortable, um, where there's culture and, and, and the like, is super super important and that's what um what uh, kevin did it's so funny the um the program called get caught reading was i'm sitting there watching my brothers two of them kevin and sean and they're having this workshop with parents around literacy and sean says you know what y'all need to get caught reading that's what that needs to be about and i was like get caught reading get caught reading and so we we ended up like taking that and developing a program around that. Matter of fact, we now have, you know, the community, um, the community, the, um, what do they call it? The learning houses, the book like community libraries. libraries. Yeah, yeah, community the libraries. little libraries that uh, folks have around the community. You can just go borrow books and bring them back or whatever. This particular community, Alice Griffith, um, largely all public housing. They're in new public housing now. Um, 
we actually have one of those, the little uh, lending libraries at each one of the buildings um, in the community. That um, and we partner with um, Children's Book Project to um, put books in there in the whole get caught reading program. So. Well, I want to take um, kind of like a quick poll from the audience. Um, just want to just take a take a look at some. So, how many of us in the room had a black teacher in your classroom? In your classroom by third grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. okay, how many of us had a uh, black teacher in your classroom in middle school? <laughs> okay, high school? Okay. Now, how many of us had a black male teacher in any of your years in K through 12? That's good. Ooh. Really good. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Okay. I was worried. We didn't anticipate that. We did not. Well, I looked at the statistics in, in 2020 and 2021 school year, only 9% of public school teachers were black um, in city schools, and 5% of teachers in private city schools were black. Um, obviously, we know the statistics are much lower um, for black men, even in San Francisco. Um, just want to ask, and starting with Randy, um, how do you feel that having a black educator presence in our schools and universities can reshape the educational experiences of our young black men? Um, well, I think a lot about that. Um, I think particularly for elementary school, um, and, and you know, not to discount it for middle school or high school too, but Education is deeply connected to exposure, generally speaking. Um, and exposure, you can throw people in elements and environments, but you, you need a tour guide through all of that. You need somebody not only that ref you can reflect ideas off of and ask questions of, um, but you need somebody that, again, you can, you can emulate and see yourself becoming. Um, and so I think while education and academics is, is wildly important, I, I think education also exists outside of the four walls of the classroom, outside of the four walls of the school. Um, and to the proximity point about bringing professionals to the community, I think we should be doing everything we can to make sure that we see teachers in the neighborhoods. And they're not traveling in from Antioch, Pittsburgh, Fairfield, and losing time that they wouldn't otherwise be able to dedicate helping educate children and being being that role model. Um, so for black boys, there's a, a lot more. There's all, I think we've always had anecdotal uh, evidence of like how important it is to put a black man in front of a black boy. But more qu quantitative as evidence has come out. Um, I think there was a study in 20, 2018 um, through a few universities and it said a few different things about it. But the, the main piece was if you put a black man in front of a black boy before sixth grade, he's 29% more likely to be interested in applying to college, 39% less likely to drop out of high school. Mm -hmm. And that holds independent, again, not to say academics don't matter, independent of how well they're doing academically. And I can say this, I'll say like in, we, we focus on elementary school, um, but what I found is that they, while you need to learn to read in order to learn everything else because you're reading to learn beyond third grade um your elementary school stuff is not going to necessarily resonate in middle school and high school and etc so if you you did poorly then that doesn't mean you're a bad student that mean that doesn't mean you can't learn and another piece of quantitative evidence is that black teachers and black men in particular are shown like heads and tails above any other teacher to have a belief a core belief that no matter how a student is performing, they can actually learn. And you can't lose that, especially over that marathon of 180 days and then the handoff to the next teacher. If you lose that belief, they see it. And when that light switch goes off for them, it may not come back on. And I think that's why we see students being diverted to a bunch of different places. But I think what is really exciting about um, more evidence, more research that's come out is that students of all backgrounds actually prefer black male teachers 
above any other teacher profile. And that those students actually get better outcomes when they have black men in front of them. Um, I think there's this notion of like more accountability and those things, but I think it really boils down to connection. Mm -hmm. I just think it went, black men are not a panacea, not a cure-all to all the educational ills that there are. But what we're seeing is that they're a universal good. There's no question about it. And so from a barometer perspective, if you show me a school system or a school site that's good at developing a black male teacher, I'm gonna show you a school that's good at developing all teachers. If you show me a school that's good at developing a black boy, I'm gonna show you a school that's good at developing all boys and girls. And so it's not like, let's just do it. Let's just hire black teachers and then it's fixed. But we get really good stuff when it happens. Uh, for me to add to that, um, while well, you guys are raising your hands with, with um, you know, when she posed the question in regards to who had um, African-American teachers or male teachers, I didn't raise mine until college. Um, but what my mom did, and I think what Randy's going to do a good job of, is we have to learn how to supplement that until black folks are in the classroom, right? So what my mom did was she found black folks that did things outside of school, right? Um, Boy Scouts, I remember I learned how to, <laughs> I learned how to um, and she made sure they were black. We went all the way to Oakland. I lived in Daly City at the time. And we would travel 30 minutes to Oakland so I could be in the Black Boy Scouts. Uh, this brother taught me how to uh, light a fire. Um, some people still can't, you know, don't know the difference between North and South. I learned how to read a compass early. So he taught me that. And then, in addition to that, like she, my mother also traveled. Um, we went to Oakland again for a cool, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kumon, but it was his after school tutoring program. And um, the ones in Daly City had all Asian folks, and it was imperative to her that I had a black teacher. So the one in Oakland um, was a black dude, and um, it was just good, as Randy said, to you know, to someone that looked like me. Um, relationships were easier to build, and uh, it was a really great experience. Um, and later on, we'll talk more about parents as an educational mentor. But my mom was my educational mentor, and she made sure we had those things. So supplementing that because we don't have it right now, I think that's um, an important factor as well. I just like to add um, maybe the, the higher ed perspective of that. So one of the things in 100% in college prep is not only do we um, prepare young people through a number of programs we have, one is called Jumpstart that just gets our ninth and 10th graders and 11th graders their mind in the game around college and career. And, and by the way, you know, we know that everybody's not going to college, um, but it's the, the same skill as preparing for college is the exact same skill of preparing for, preparing for a career. You have to know how to read, write, take exams, study, all of that, so it's the same. It's always someone in the back room like, hey, everybody's not going to college. Absolutely right. But when we found that we prepared students through our Jumpstart program, through our Step to College program, which is um, a dual enrollment with San Francisco State, where our students can earn up to six units, um, historical black college, annual historical black college tour that we're now taking. Our last one was in 2019, of course, because of the pandemic. So this year at the end of March, we'll be taking 40 students to a HBCU tour. Um, going to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, to uh, Morgan State, we got a student there. We're going to Howard, we got three students at Howard. Um, we're going to Hampton, we got a student at Hampton and a couple of other uh, colleges in, in Virginia. But I brought up the, the higher ed because Randy talked about belief. And our students who attend HBCUs, this is what, what Randy talked about when a black student, a black professor um, see that a light has gone out in a student, that a student stopped showing up to class. And those in HBCUs, we hear it over and over and over again from our students that attend those institutions, that their professor will call them on the phone, that their professor will show up at their dorm room, that their professor will pull them to the side and ask, is you know, something wrong? How can I support you? And that is very crucial to have those educators um, in your life if you're blessed to have, and there's so many people in the room had them early on, which is just like, just fantastic. Um, but to continue that into college, when usually it's really hands off, at PWIs, predominantly white institutions, 
we definitely hear that's not, it's not always the same. And not to say that there are some caring um, professors and lecturers at that level who are not black, but you just get a different cultural, it's nuanced, right, of what um, these professors see. Because oftentimes they see um, these young people and they see themselves, right? And so we've had young people to, um, get just above a 2.0, a HBCU take them on, sometimes on probation. And we have one of those students today that has a master's degree. And, um, and that's, you know, a number of them, right? And, and she was not, she, you know, she has talked to our young people and said, I'm here to tell you, I was not an exceptional student. You know, I just barely made the minimum of getting into college but she started off at a HBCU, graduated from a HBCU, and then went to you know regular college. Uh, matter of fact, she has her PhD. She's now back in in Georgia working for Kaiser as a um, psych child psychologist. So she was not again not an exceptional student, but what that HBCU gave her at the undergraduate level, she said she could never never get she felt like she could never get something like that somewhere else and so that gave her the level of confidence that she needed because of the nurturing environment that we're talking about that oftentimes black educators will will give to to black students um, because they 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 see certain things because of their own you know experiences i believe so if I can just add to that from a post-secondary student uh, standpoint, uh, I'm going to put my program manager role on now. Uh, I told him I wasn't going to call him out, but if I could have Brother Deontay and Brother Stafford stand up real quick. Just stand up real quick. Just stand up real quick. Just stand up real quick. Right, so, uh, these two are, um, are, uh, are our college coaches in our D2 college program, where we uh, manage and support 100 college students. Um, just talking about you know the importance of having a black face and a black figure, I think there's more than that too, right? We're talking about combined struggles. Um, Brother Stafford has a master's in communication, right? And um, you know most of our students that we work with, they're students that are, are dealing with um, multiple issues as they're you know matriculating through college, right? You know they're not it's not paid for them, right? So they might be working two or three jobs. They might be trying to support their dorm tuitions, right? So I think seeing Deontay and Stafford um, for black educators and black males. Um, really does something for them, right? Um, unfortunately, we can't really be hands-on with all of them because the students are all across the nation, but they have done a San Jose State, the PWI, San Francisco State, and um, really worked hand-to-hand -hand with our students. So I, I think continuing that at a, a post-secondary level is important as well. And this is the program that DKI funding actually pays for as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. I really like that we kind of touched on the community and like the environment and how much um, adults around a student can really shape their experience in addition to the educators. So we touched on, kind of introduced that we're going to talk about parental involvement in education. Um, obviously there's studies that show that parental involvement can really help with cognitive development and really help with students feeling like, okay, I have somebody pushing me to do well in school. My mom and dad are checking on me or you know, grandma's really like, hey, I'll pay you if you get an A, you know, whatever it is. Like having those adults around you, supporting you, um, obviously helps a student want to, you know, go further. Um, and I was looking up the research and it actually said that black families are very involved and it doesn't always have to be inside the classroom um, or you know, in the school site. It often happens outside of school, it happens talking to the coaches of their sports teams talking to their tutors, talking to uh, their teachers, checking on their homework at, um, at home, you know, taking them to, uh, you know, conferences or events outside of the school system. Uh, so, and oftentimes, and I think some of the research said that parents do that often as a response to racial mistreatment. They're worried about their kids being discriminated against in the school system. So they're really keeping a hypervigilant perspective on their kids. Sorry to make that really long, but um, just wanted to ask the panel, um, what have been your experiences with parents as partners um, in the education process? And if you can give any reflections um, of like positive examples of parents showing up with their students. Um, I'd love to start with that again. So yeah, thank you. Um, 
So as I said earlier in my introduction, 100% um, College Prep largely started by um, a parent group, um, actually. My cousin and I had an, had an idea, but we went to parents and parents were one that really brought it together. We have one in the audience and uh, that is Dr. Sai. Uh, actually, Saida is sitting out there, but that's Dr. Sai's mom. And oh. Saida went through our program, started at eighth grade. Um, oh, another student yeah. that um, uh, had not quite reached her potential as she was transitioning into high school, now she has a P she has a PhD as well. You know, um, but I think um, as you stated, uh, oftentimes. You know, the data is different and they say, you know, black parents are not involved. Or what does involvement really look like? You know, and, and as someone said the other day, who defines involvement? Right. And so if um, a parent's involvement may be getting their child um, ready for school and to school on time. That's involvement. Um, and it, it doesn't look like a cookie cutter. I think one of the presenters said it this morning. Uh, you know, being a part of the PTA, you know, or being a, a, another part of, you know, coming to the school all the time. What I think sometimes what um, educators don't realize is some parents and families have their own trauma around what they went through in school. Matter of fact, in um, the Alice Griffith community that we talked about, um, also known as Double Rock, um, we have a parent ambassador and he said, I, we were talking and he said, I'll never go into the schools. Just let me deal with the kids and, and the parents in the community and, and encouraging them to come to workshops. But I'm not going back into a schoolhouse because, yeah, I have my own issues. And so he'll just walk through the door and it, the trauma will just show up all over again. So we have a number of parents in our community that experience that. Right. And so the only thing, the only time they were asked to come to school is, is for something negative. Right. Something happened with their child. There's some behavioral issues uh, and so on and so forth. And so I think, um, first of all, schools need to come into the community and talk to parents, talk to parents individually, step outside of your building when they're picking them up from, you know, from school. Have a conversation. I just want to hear, you know, what's going on. You see anything good? Your son is good. Say some good things and not always the negative things as well. But involvement um, looks very different. And oftentimes that involvement happens in our community that prepares our young people to be ready for school, right? You do, I often say that um, you could be your child's educational mentor and make sure that they get what they need and do well in algebra, but you don't have to know algebra. Right. You don't have to know algebra, but you have to make sure that your child is getting the education that they're supposed to get and that they're prepared. Right. And, and so, again, you know, involvement can look very different. But then it's up to the educators to also ask parents what it is they do, can do, want to do. What should the, how should the school change certain dynamics about how they're educating their children and other children as well? Um, yeah, just to add to that, um, I would touch on the, the, the parent as an um, educational mentor. Um, some live examples that we have at AG and some things that we noticed were that we had parents that couldn't even read or write, right? But their children were excelling well. Um, and why was that? Because they were navigating through the system. Um, they went through every workshop. Um, they knew how to, even though they couldn't read or write, they knew how to pick up on um, if our if his or her student was reading fluently, right? Oh, you know, can you repeat that? Can you comprehend that for me, right? So coming to these workshops and really um, listening and picking up um, all the, the, the skills and traits that were taught to them, they really utilize that. Um, I also would, would add on to that is um, giving parents the opportunity to combat what was going on at the school, right? And how do they go about doing that and um, equipping them with the tools to do so. As Diane mentioned earlier in regards to, you know, how um, teachers, communicate and convey things to um, to parents, right? Most of the time you get a phone call, it's negative. Mm -hmm. But when in Double Rock, we had teachers, we had parents parents actually go and talk to their teachers like, hey, this is my expectations for you. I don't mind you calling me, but please when you call me, at least give me three positives before you give me any negatives about my child, right? Mm -hmm. So now like I'm more open to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. It's not just you calling me and saying, hey, 
um, you know, your, your child's doing A, B, C, and D again, right? Well, what are the things that you worked on? How are we continue to work on those things? And like, let's build a relationship. So if the, the school is not building it, you got to build it in the community, and then the community takes it to the school. So that's what we've been doing. That's been working for us, per se. Yeah, and I, I, I don't have much to add on that. <laughs> that's exactly right. The, the one thing I can mention um, as far as the importance of parents, I mean, it just goes without saying, but the power of parents really, mm -hmm. specifically as it relates to the school, and why it's, it's kind of mind-boggling that they don't get better treatment sometimes when they're going to these schools is that there's something called 88 dollars that are calculated at the beginning of the year and schools get money based on what students they have in those schools so specifically with elementary school students they're not getting there without the parent for the most part you know if, if you're in a neighborhood school and your kid can walk there maybe but for the most part you have to be able to convince parents that this is a place that this child is going to be welcome and it's a it's a joint package. You can't have the kid without the parent. Um, uh, but like kind of wrapping back into some of the other the topics and like one of the really encouraging things we've seen with some of our teachers is that on that attendance stuff, we, there's some schools in, uh, down in the Bayview that are under enrolled. And we had one of our um, one of our teachers at one of the early schools. Um, and word got out that there was a black kindergarten teacher, a black male kindergarten teacher. Um, and that very next year, there was about a 20% uptick in attendance. And now because the attendance was low, 20% wasn't like mind boggling, but also 20%. Um, and it's because he actually took the time to Kevin's point to build relationships and trust. And sometimes not even talk about the kid. Let me just talk to you. How are you doing, Ms. Jones? What's going on? This is what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. Can I, can I share with you a little bit about what I'm talking about in my class this week? And it doesn't have to even be a conversation around progress for your kid. Mm -hmm. I know that's relevant and we should do that, but in the, in the relationship mm -hmm. building process, um, hopefully they're considering some of these folks friends mm -hmm. at some point in time. Um, you're talking about any and everything. You have to be have that level of openness and communication and the better you can connect with somebody. And I think there's some research out there somewhere that talks about cultural similarities providing for better and easier connections. Um, that's something what we've seen work well in getting parents more excited to do that. touch on um, a common um, common theme between your two organizations is that you serve students that are attending HBCUs or are alumni from HBCUs. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. You know, they offer virtual, hybrid, in-person programming, everything to meet students where they are, even if it's just in another state at a different time zone. Um, so I wanted to hear from you all, um, what are some of the challenges that you've heard from your fellows that are alumni um, or your students that are maybe attending HBCUs or even P uh, PWIs, um, and how does that inform your strategies for recruitment, creating programs, um, sharing resources, and retention? Um, and I'd like to hear from Kevin if I can first. Yeah, um, I'll give some quick insight to the Get Through College program. Um, we currently have 100 students um, from San Francisco um, that are all throughout the nation. And um, they pretty much participate in this program, which covers four um, four main things that they have to do throughout the month, right? Um, the first thing is meet with their ambassador, um, which is a student who's a junior or a senior that's going through the same her, her, um, obstacles and hurdles that they're going through or that they've already, um, already been through as well. Um, and then they have to meet with their college coaches, which is Deontay and Brother Stefan, who I, I talked about earlier. And then they have to attend two workshops on Thursdays. Um, one workshop is more geared towards um, exploration and entrepreneurship, where the other one is really like heavy um, academic based, right? How to prepare you for academia. We have student council, uh, councils come in there and really just debrief them on, you know, some of the things that they would be going through throughout college. Um, for us, um, some of the biggest things that we've seen, and as I mentioned earlier about um, the peer relationships between the ambassadors who are college students, um, they pretty much run those meetings on Thursdays, right? And I said earlier, like, as nonprofits, we, we can't dictate what students want, right? So we have the ambassadors pretty much run those meetings. Um, they've been through it as well. 
they're continuing to go through it and students tend to ask as my brother over here just mentioned, um, with similarities, right, cultural similarities as well, um, they tend to respond a lot better to them. So um, I think for us, the most important thing has been an active level of communication, um, being able to help alleviate some of those barriers. So within the program, you do get a thousand dollar stipend that you earn. You attend four of these things that I just mentioned, right? Um, so I, I think for us, being able, being able to alleviate some of the barriers that they have while also supporting them has been really productive. And one of the things that we did with the um, Get Through College program um, is that uh, we took a survey and we wanted to know what were, you know, some of their challenges as college students. And of course, you know, number one thing is finances. You know, how can I get a grant or scholarship um, to further my education? Um, and then the second thing was financial literacy. And so what we did was, um, in supporting them, we have a library of scholarships and internships that they can tap into. Um, we have something called, um, some folks may have heard of it called Slack. And so they're all on Slack and we can we post up internships and, and all kinds of stuff on that. Um, but, um, oh, it just went out. Um, the, uh, one of the most, oh, the important thing, around um, financial literacy is that we partnered with the Office of um, Financial Empowerment. And that's out of the Treasury Tax Collector's Office here. And you can get a, and anyone in the room can actually sign up for this, Office of Financial Empowerment. You can get a financial um, literacy coach. Mm. And you can have, you have to be at least 18 years old, but you can have a coach as long as you want to. Each one of our students are required to have a financial literacy coach. And I think you have to go through four sessions and you get a certificate. So they, you know, they set up budgets, they teach you how to do all of these things. So you at least have to do four sessions to obtain that, that, um, that certificate in order to continue your stipend. So we have monthly stipends, they get barrier removal, uh, a year of $1,500 barrier removal. They can get a laptop, they can get more books, they can get um, additional things. They can even pay rent if that's a barrier. And so there is a committee that looks at all of the, the uh, barrier um, applications and those kind of things. So, but what we've heard from students, and, and maybe Kevin could talk more about this in, um, in a recent survey, the students who are um, feeling sort of isolated in schools where there are not many African-American students felt like this cohort that they're in. So they're in cohorts of 10. And so there are 10 um, ambassadors and each ambassadors have a group of their own peers of nine. So um, these um, ambassadors, as was said, does workshops and then they also do kind of group sessions. And these um, students who, like I said, are feeling a little isolated there in some areas they've never lived before. They don't have family there and they're, they're there in college and, and may be the only African-American oftentimes in most of their classes. They felt like these groups were a sense of community for them, right? They could talk about their isolation. They could get um, ideas from other students. Some students have started clubs on their campus right um through just talking to their group um their cohort and so this is a kind of community that we want to create with the program but at the same time is it's getting them through college you know it's keeping them on that journey and saying and, and you know in with their peer this peer-to-peer -peer exchange you can do this you know, I've done it. I've been I've done it for three years. You know, you're in your freshman year. You can do this. Right. And and then with that, the coaches locally have gone to Sacramento State to check out. We had a whole situation at Sacramento State where we're looking at transcripts of students and we're like, why are they in upper level science classes already? And we found out that there was um, in STEM STEM majors or something, mm -hmm. they were required to take these courses, but they, they didn't do well, and right? Try, and so you guys, you guys went down the sack to do that, so. Yeah. And then just, just to add to that, right, like, um, if you have a student that's at a Sac State or San Francisco State, uh, all these state schools, what they're doing now is they're pushing 
So let's say I want to go do a, um, I want to major in business, right? So their first year, they were pre populate their class for STEM. I'm sorry, I want to major in, let's say I'm majoring in biology, which the student was majoring in biology at Sat State. Um, by the time she looked at her classes, they already had her classes booked for her, right? And this is a freshman. She's transitioning everything by herself. Um, yeah, she has our help, but at that point, it's like, how do I navigate through this, right? So we were able to hook her up with a sister um, that runs the STEM department at Sat State. Um, she showed us the ins and outs of it, because when I went to SF State, you picked your own classes, you met with a counselor, and it was different, right? So we had to adjust to the new systems that they have in place, right? So I think it's imperative that we know how to move and navigate through that, so that way we can show them how to navigate through it, right? Now that we know, um, we've been holding seminars, um, a Thursday uh, meeting last week, they talked about that. They talked about some of the classes and some of the things that you can do after they, they even pre-populate your classes. So after they pre-populate, you can still go in and um, make the classes according to your schedule. Um, I also think of, um, what Diane had mentioned about the experiences and then being able to talk to each other amongst it. Um, as we all know, you know, black is not monolith, right? So I also think that the college experience is not monolithic. Mm -hmm. So everybody is going through their own struggles. Um, Folks are being able to express that with each other, and then they can realize that, hey, you know, I, as she mentioned, I've gone through this, I can get through it, and I'm not the only one that's going through this, right? I mean, at this point, at, in the beginning of the program, folks were calling me all the time. Now they're calling their ambassadors. I mean, it's pretty much running itself now, right? And that's what we want it to be. We want them to have this intimate relationship with their ambassadors, so that way, they're able to handle things on their own, and they can go to them and resort to them, right? So, and then the plan is for those ambassadors to come back into the community and do what we're doing, right? Yeah. So, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, they're walking the same halls, so. Yeah. 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 Before you ask the next question in the second part, I just want to welcome, we got some new, some heavyweights in the room. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nunley, some folks from there, we always <laughs> want to say welcome to Dr. Spears back there. Um, just really want to welcome a lot of the folks who walked in. So we've got, got a couple more questions that we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. So bear with us. Just want to let you know that we're getting there. So thank you. Yes. Um, and I also wanted to hear from the panel, um, in what ways has DKI's financial investment really helped you um, with trying to achieve your goals and like furthering the mission for your organizations? Uh, yes, so it helped a lot. It's been an incredible, um, it's been an incredible partnership. And I'm actually, I'm really excited just listening here. I didn't even know y'all had this going on. We got, so I got to shout out one of our team members, Dominique in the back. We were able to hire our first full-time recruiter uh, with Dominique. Um, because we have this university network to manage. You know, 25 HBCUs, trying to build out to build to around 10 or so California universities. Um, and then also going for what we call career switchers, you know, going for black men uh, in whatever level of career, whatever area of career, but three years and under. Just looking at the trends, millennial and Gen Z folk don't stay in jobs that long. And so if we can ch cherry pick and get somebody to join, we really need somebody dedicated to that. The DKI investment helped us do that. Um, we've been very lean, um, as Diane can attest. <laughs> we've been very lean for a long time, um, but um, being able to really build out the team and the bench is, 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 is critical. And one thing that Brother Kevin talked about, um, I'm so glad you said this, that black is not a monolith, um, is so true in, in so many ways, but uh, we recruit from HBCUs, not necessarily bringing Bay Area natives back, Sometimes we're bringing back guys from Atlanta, from Alabama, from wherever, and they don't know what hyphy is. They don't know what, they don't know what, they don't know what Pippin is. Um, uh, one of them had a car, and you know, his car got broken too in like second week. And he's like, damn, like, you know, like all you can do is shake your head. <laughs> but you got, but you got to kind of explain, and you just understand, you know, this is like, people hurt out here, bro. Like, this is what it is. Um, uh, but the investment has allowed us to spend more time building that community, cohorting with folk. Um, yes, we pay for you know credentialing work. Yes, we get them. Uh, mental wellness supports. They have a black male therapist that they go see, but also we make sure they get out in the community. They get to First Fridays. Um, they, they, <laughs> they, get to, they get to some of the Juneteenth events that are out here. Um, and just, you know, we want to have fun and do it as cost effective as we can, but this is, the, this is San Francisco. It 
costs money to have anything here, um, let alone fun. Um, and so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, black fun, right? Like, like, you know, we can spread out. So it costs gas money, $5 a gallon. Like, you gotta be able to get to places. Uh, but the, the, without getting onto like the line items that is supported, um, it really has allowed us to build this cohesive set of supports, um, social supports, social concierge, as we like to call it, that makes these men feel like they actually are home mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Because we're asking them to do a heavy duty lift. Mm -hmm. We're asking them to help build our, our future right. and keep these kids here to be able to live for the next 40, 50 years as San Franciscans. Mm -hmm. um, and they have to be comfortable in doing it. So thank you, DK. Thank you. DK. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, it's been a great investment um, to our program as well because I think prior to this, the missing link was supporting um, college to students who were already in college. And um, some years ago, um, I wanted to uh, start this program called To and Through. And it was really um, getting our kids into uh, having them enroll in community college you know, as a, uh, 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 a re you know, reduced cost way of getting through college. But we found that they were spending, they were just spinning their wheels at, mm -hmm. in community college, right? And we already know community college data is, is the rate of graduating from community college is low across the board, right, regardless right. of ethnicity. Right. Um, but our kids were just spinning their wheels. And so I was thinking of this program called Through to and through and how we can support that. And then I just Googled it, Googled something similar and found a program very similar in New York. And I was visiting, I was gonna visit New York. And so I ended up contacting these folks and um, I actually visited their program. And it was really a con con what we call here continuation school. So these were young people who were in high school, but they were up to like 22 years old still and trying to get out of high school. Mm -hmm. And they had some very similar, some similar things to what we see in the Get Through College program where students were actually leading the charge in supporting their peers. And so kept trying to get funding for it, funding for it. And I had this idea probably about uh, 10 years ago, I had this idea and just could never get funding for it. So when the opportunity came with um, DKI, I was like, hey, this is the missing piece of supporting our college students, not only financially, which that is built into it as well, as I said earlier, but, you know, emotionally, um, you know, the whole social emotional um, support that get through college provides um, for college students. And so um, DKI has just been wonderful um, for these young people. And um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just been really powerful for them. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm gonna preempt, uh, we're getting this sign over here. It's time to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, so Kevin, I'm gonna preempt you. Thank okay. you, sorry. That's all good. Before we do break out though, a few things. Um, Thank you, panel. Thank you, yes. thank you, thank, thank you. you. Over on the table, there's a uh, uh, paper that, for those who want to leave their email for contact, please uh, leave your email. And um, if you have one of these panelists or our office want to follow up with you, just put a little note and we'll make sure that we get back with you. Um, I also want to uh, uh, thank my colleague, Ren Floyd Rodriguez over there, that's sort of keeping the time frame in the bags, and also Vera, Vera Garcia, Veronica Garcia, uh, who's also been taking pictures and kind of keeping the, keeping things online, so thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a couple bags over there for those who have not had an opportunity to take one. I don't know if Zara's as good as others, but it's pretty good. So. <laughs> um, they were clapping next door, but we were having fun too, so don't get jealous over there. <laughs> Before we do the, I know we're gonna uh, uh, break up. There's a rooftop reception for those who did not know. So for those who can stay around, please do. But I did wanna just take a moment. Was there any burning questions that someone had to uh, ask the panel? Yes. Hi, y'all. Hey. My name is Brianna Frierson. Um, I'm going to ask this question. Not, uh, but so I, San Francisco native, 
Uh, grew up on the other side of the baby, so Sunnydale. <laughs> on the um, other side, stop. <laughs> yeah, on the other side. The other side of District 10, uh, Sunnydale. So I wanted to ask because, for one, love the story of 100% college prep, for to be 100% honest. What y'all do um, is very similar to a book I read in high school, The Promise by Orly Brown and her foundation. Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh-huh. And that got me very interested in education and trying to get people there very young. Uh, one thing that I noticed while I was in college, HBCU alum as well, um, a group of your students actually came my junior and senior year. Um, and we kind of hijacked their whole tour, so so sorry. What, which college? Fisk University. Oh, okay, Fisk. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm in one of those. But yeah, so I wanted to ask you how could we get 100% college prep to also venture outside of Bayview to those who are in need but won't? Cross the, the tracks of the T line. Um, yeah. Won't come over there because yeah. I know like there have been some years where like some Sunnydale kids may come, yeah. and then the next year it'd be some Tower kids that mm-hmm. come, but they won't ever come at the same time. Right. Um, especially like hearing the work that you guys um, do with young men and young women. Like right now, I've been working with our young men and women in Sunnydale, and our young men do not think college is an option. Right. So because inside we don't have that program, like, you know, we got people who we, of course, try and pour into them. But right. like you guys have a strong foundational program. So how would we be able to partner with you, get you guys to move and like, well, not move locations, but like, but you know, move outside. The, yeah, move yeah, outside of, abso- of Bayview. Absolutely. Um, number one, we could talk afterwards because we would definitely um do something like that one thing that we have we do try to have some of our programs um online so we do have um, our jumpstart program which is online um and they try to make it fun it's actually um taught by one of our alums um and but uh, in person yes let's talk because we in our after school program right now is you know it's been really really slow um, which is quite unusual, but you know, coming out of the pandemic and all of that. We're also in, in school sites as well. So we're in um, five, high, we have coaches um, pretty much full time in three high schools, part time in two high schools, and then um, two middle schools, and then Bret Hart. Um, so we have coaches there as well that can support. So if, you know, students from Sunnydale that attend some of our schools, that's one way. And then another way we could talk afterwards to uh, see how we can partner and maybe even just start one day a week at uh, after school program at Sunnydale. We could do that. If, if I could just, if I could just add to that real quick and then okay. we'll, we'll get right to you, my dear sister. Um, yeah, you know, from the community, um, my little cousin, I used to bring him out, Raymond Brown, we, we don't keep a community, but I used to bring him there all the time. Like you said, we would filter out here and there, right? But um, I'll also say this though, um, at Balboa, we do have our satellites out at Balboa, and we do work with a lot of St. Louis kids at Balboa, but I think it would be dope to venture out, and we'll talk more about that later. Yeah. I wanted to, um, young man, you, you said something that's like, oh my goodness, you said that the millennials, they jump around jobs, right? You know, mm-hmm. so when they're jumping, are they like grabbing, these good skills so they could be an entrepreneur or do you, do you know what I'm saying? Cause it's like, it's cool to move around yeah. and bring, bring something with you and keep elevating. Right. So is that, is it like upward mobility or? Well, lateral. I wish I had a deeper understanding of workforce trends. Um, and it's, it's been something we've talked about because I think it's a really important nexus to create. Education is basically our best workforce development strategy and system. Um, So when we get there though, um, at least what we've seen from some of the guys and and, uh, we try to go after seniors um, as as our main recruit for black male teachers. Um, But it ranges because some folks are on the five year, six year plan. Some people have gaps, go to the military, want to come back. So we we actually, our sweet spot is 22 to 32. And this is our first year, it's a pretty nascent program. So this, uh, this is our first year having graduating fellows go out. And all of them are very interested in upper mobility. They, or, or staying in teaching. The fact is that our housing supports are gonna run out. I can't, we can't is stay just, with them forever. The 12th grade, are they stepping into higher ed? 
Oh, so no, he has oh no, the, these are these are bachelor degree holding men okay. to become teachers. So, teachers but, that, but are they then administrators? You know, you know. What oh, I'm saying? got what you're saying. Like, yeah. You, so, you know, some like are interested gotta, in that. Because if not, you have to see it to believe it. You do. You know what I'm saying? So. But for them to stay here, one thing that they're all interested in, they, they want a job. Some of them are looking at tech. And they're like, oh, I can get a job with Meta or Google or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but they also want their side hustles. Mm -hmm. and, and being here in the Bay where it's, it's not frowned upon for you to be multifaceted. That's right. They, they would like to build out an entrepreneurial arm to their to their life. Um, so I know maybe that's not a perfect yeah, answer yeah, to you. Become, but. Yes, it is. They become educational consultants and you can get paid big time. Oh, yes, so yeah. You can still keep your day job. Some contract you up. <laughs> 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 yes, please. So, um, yeah, I, I hear a lot of people talk to my colleagues and I remember when I when, when you had the building first, when you first started, I used to come by over there mm -hmm. and for one of my daughters. And then my one of my other daughters Come, but they were too young. Mm. But both of them in college now, though. But um, I, I, I'm, 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 you know, for for me as a parent, a single parent, and have to liberate through all the systems and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm hearing about you know high school and you know some middle school. But what about the younger children? You know, because see, I, my daughter had a problem, and I didn't know she had a problem. Mm. You know, and so they had a program, you know, like for preschool. Like Glide had a program called the Infant Program. So they went to the infant program, then when they went to the preschool. So they had people to come and see where they're on the milestone. And they wasn't, and then so they, they, they got that extra help, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, speech and language, you know, yeah. because some mm -hmm. of us, you know, we, 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 we talk differently mm -hmm. at, at our, at our sure. houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some people, we need speech and language, right. you know, so it's like, how can you collaborate, like, you know, where, where you bringing all that together, like, you know, let's get a preschool, like two or three preschools mm -hmm. that's um, featured around African Americans and making sure those things are done in there. And then making sure, like, you know, the, you know getting to the elementary because, right. you know, you said third grade. And, you know, it is very important right. for a child to learn how to read, but it's also important for them to be exposed to other things. Yeah. You well, know, um, one of the things the way we did this over the last couple of summers is um, through the Get Caught Reading program, we had a summer Get Caught Reading program. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we trained um, a group of students, few of them in high school, but most of them in, in college, came home um, from college and uh, were trained by teachers and educators in SFUSD, Black teachers and educators from the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators. Mm -hmm. And what they were, they then, they were then dispatched to different um, summer programs in our community mm -hmm. and they work with them on reading um, uh, HRC was a part of this because they provided their um, literacy program is called everybody reads mm -hmm. everybody I, I'm, reads I'm with yeah the and program. so each student got a um, briefcase full of books yeah I'm familiar with the right. reading programs with Cheryl Davis right started off in the film right program. right I so I part of that so what that I is, so right it's like with the books yeah when we did the books we went on those trips and we exposed the kids to the plants and the, the bridges and stuff. But I'm just like, how can y'all bring all this together from preschool all the way up? You know, yeah, making sure from that they all to, get, you know. Like a cradle to career. A, you know, we can't get them program. when they third grade yeah. to fourth grade. We're working grade. on something you know, like we need that to, too. Everybody needs to collaborate together and say, hey, this yeah, is the big well, picture. Let's get it, let's get it going yeah. Yeah. this way. Yeah, oh, Why, oh, um, young community. Instead of oh, just oh, like oh, we do. Oh, oh, okay. So young, young community developers is actually Actually working on Cradle and Career program. I don't know if I was supposed to announce that, but anyway, we've been working on it because it, exactly they do the young community developers. Yeah, and so Cradle to Career, which is not is not a new concept really. Um, one of the bigger ones is Harlem Children's Zone, you know, in Harlem. But um, in looking at workforce, looking at college and education, but going all the way down to exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, brain development, all of that. What does that look like and what to make sure what families need from right. the very beginning of infancy and even prenatal care all the way through. That includes pre-K, um, you know, um, learning challenges that students may have or whatever. Recognizing all of that and providing the services that are needed as they're going along at each stage. So we're looking at what happens from zero to six age. You know, what are the things that need to happen and need to, you know, what happens from seven 
to 11, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's it's that's what we're working on right now. Just yeah, met I, I, I just, I'm recently. just saying that because I know for, for me, it was, it was like for me, I I did that struggle, you know, right? Because it was no, it was nothing for me, you know. I, you know, even with the speech and language, I had to go outside my neighborhood, neighborhood. because they didn't have a round table in yeah. my neighborhood, yeah, mm-hmm. you right. know. So I ended up in Pacific Heights at the round table, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, because I was like, Where's the services? Oh, but they don't have one here, but oh, yeah. we can get you over here mm-hmm. because yeah. I fight it for that, mm-hmm. and so. Well, I'm saying we need to fight more to get all these services that they do have for us, yeah. but no one's willing to step yeah. up and say, oh, well, I do this or, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's what the vision. We have, we have people, our kids have yeah. language and, you know, speech. Yeah. Even. Yeah. And then, you know, when the kids need to be tested, they, the teachers used to tell the parents. Now the parents got to go tell the teacher, could you have my child tested? Yeah. yeah. That's not right. Yeah. You know, so. I'm going to interrupt real quick, just quick. So a couple of things. I got three questions. I got three hands that I'm going to get to. For those who do feel well, we need to get up and want to do something. Don't feel like you're going to insult folks if you need the room, leave the room. And I'm going to ask the panel if it's okay if you stay a little longer to sure. answer some more questions. Mm-hmm. But with that said, um, Dr. Spears? Yeah, so two things. Um, so I'm an ECE educator at heart. Childhood educator. And so, what you're speaking about actually, uh, Children's Council has a pipeline um, to career program where they are educating. So, there's a cohort of 40 individuals that are going through the program to either be placed at a center to work or open up their own family child care with the vision in mind of being really Afrocentric and really being um, and focusing on educating black children. Um, I developed that program, and our model was. Um, every child deserves to have a black teacher. Mm, Um, Black children need to see themselves represented and mirrored in the community, but also other children need to see that black individuals are capable and able to be leaders. Um, So that program, they're on cohort number two. So I I transitioned from Mm. there, but they're still thriving and they are a DKI recipient. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, the first cohort, we were able to graduate 25 individuals. And I'm proud to say that five of those individuals have opened up their own family child care. And a handful of them are already been placed at a center to work. So the work is is happening and is going on. Um, I am now though with support for families of San Francisco. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. (laughs) If all of our dreaming forward family can please head to the second floor main auditorium. Please head to the second floor main auditorium so we can close our program. Again, Dreaming Forward attendees, please head to the second floor auditorium so we can close our program. Don't tell Dr. Shots in there. Don't tell that. But very quickly, I am with Support for Families of San Francisco. So we are a nonprofit that is really helping and supporting families access um, and navigate special education. So we do know and understand that this is a really hard um, venture to access. And so we are here, we're a parent empowerment center. So we are looking to support families who are having trouble accessing speech and language services for their child. Give me your card. <laughs> she finished it up, but 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 my my question is to say yes. The question is to say though too is is how can right and then partnering partnering with the people who are in the community. So it's not necessarily a question, but I would love to be able to partner with your your agencies and organizations so that way your teachers know about support for families and your scholars and educators know about support for families, so that way the parents and programs they're working with, we can make sure that families get supported.